USA South Africa has been on an economic and political roller coaster ride for the past 10 years and especially the past few years would be an understatement. Now capturing that ride is this book, How to Steal a Country, State of Capture and Hopes for the Future of South Africa. With me is the author of the book, Lord Robin Rennick. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you for inviting me. At the time that you um, that Nelson Mandela was released, you happened to be the British ambassador to South Africa. Mm. How did you feel? Did you think at that point, as he was walking out of prison, that this could be where the country would end up? No, and of course I had many meetings with Mandela after he was released from prison because he needed a lot of help at the time. We even had to help train his bodyguards, improve the security of his house. I had lots of meetings with him about problems in the negotiations and so on. And I knew all, all about him from Helen Sussman, who knew him well. But I've never met a more impressive leader anywhere, um, you know, with great humanity. His whole approach to the future of South Africa was inclusive. Uh, and this was extraordinary political leadership, also by F.W. de Klerk, by the way. Uh, it took two, two important leaders to turn this country around. So it's been very distressing to see this extraordinary dissent in terms of political leadership in South Africa from Mandela up here, mm. admired worldwide, to Jacob Zuma in the last three or four years with the just amazing sheer looting of the South African state uh, treasury. And this is not stealing from the, the rich, this was stealing from the social grants, from student grants and so on and so forth, to the tune of 200 billion rand, according to Pravin Gordon, 15 billion dollars disappearing into the coffers of Zuma and his, of, of his friends, family, associates and so on. Now, um, when did the rot set in? As we stand today, and look at it from the perspective of today, with, uh, if we don't look back too far, we think it set in with the Guptas. But it actually started a little bit earlier. Well, it did. I mean, when um, the ANC came back from exile and so on, um, Halema Motlanti, you know, who's a, uh, who was the Secretary General, was very worried about the fact that people didn't had no training in how to allocate contracts. Uh, dodgy businessmen would say, you know, if you give me the contract I will look after your children's education or pay you in other ways and so on. And quite a lot of that was happening in the provinces for sure, you know, c in the municipalities and so on. And he, you know, he denounced that uh, in a, at an ANC conference at the time. But this was, uh, this was, th there was then the arms deal. And the arms deal when, you know, some huge transactions took place. I mean, why on earth South Africa needed, I asked at the time, why do you need three submarines? You know, who is, what are you going to use these submarines for? Who is threatening you? There was no answer, and that was done on a partly corrupt basis, sadly, as Patricia DeLille, you know, very, and Andrew Feinstein, very convincingly pointed out and campaigned against. But none of this compared with what happened in the Zuma second term. In the Zuma second term, the, you, it became impossible to do business with the big government agencies, uh, ESCOM and Transnet or Danel, without going through the Guptas and their associates. They were the gatekeepers, and there was a sort of shadow state. A wonderful uh, study of this called Betrayal of the Promise by the Public Affairs Research Institute. And then, you know, Tuli Manon Sellers, a fantastic report on state of capture. And this is one of the extraordinary things about South Africa. In times of crisis, this country throws up some extraordinary people, like Desmond Tutu, like Helen Sussman, like Mandela, like de Klerk, actually. And this time round, it threw up your public protector, Tuli Melancella. There's going to be a presentation to her in Cape Town next week, um, and I look, which I look forward to very much indeed, a lot of people are coming to that, because she has earned a huge amount of you know, admiration. She showed great courage. She was threatened, she was accused of being a CIA agent and all of this, whereas she was just a, a, a totally honorable lawyer doing her duty and believing in the Constitution she helped to write, 
as well as Cyril Ramaphosa, and believing in Mandela values. You dedicated the book to her. And to Pravin Gordon, and to the South African press, who put up an extraordinary performance in all this. You know, you should be very proud of your press. Um, you know, and that's widespread, but I <coughs> would particularly mention the Daily Maverick and its fantastic reporting. Amo Bangani, you know, the dung beetle which always persists in uncovering, in this case, the truth. The judges who, you know, acted absolutely without fear or favor. That judgment by the entire constitutional court, unanimous, all in their ceremonial robes, was a turning point in South Africa and also civil society. I've never seen non-governmental organizations operate more effectively than I've seen here in the last three or four years, challenging the government and the courts, winning crucial cases in the courts. You know, the, the Freedom Under Law, the Helen Sisman Foundation, the Organization for Undoing Tax Abuse, the Katrada Foundation, the other foundations, you have a great deal to be proud of. That's what the book is dedicated to. You also collaborated with the cartoonist Sapiro. Well, I was absolutely thrilled that this book brought me into very close contact, not only with Thule, uh, but with Zapiro, because I honestly believe he's the world's best cartoonist. I love his cartoons. They're so accurate, and he kindly let me use which, whatever cartoons I wanted to do uh, in, this, in this book. And I promise you, it's worth buying for the cartoons. <laughs> Forget about the text. My absolute favorite being the one where Tudy Madoncella is depicted as cutting off various parts of Jacob Zuma, and he is saying, it's only a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> also love yeah. the one where Pravin Gordon gets arrested. Yes. Yeah. And also, when, Z when Cyril has taken over, and President Zuma is strapped to a rocket, ready for takeoff, and Cyril is saying, launch, damn it, as he tries <laughs> to press the button to put him into orbit. <laughs> so, so it was a lot of fun right. to deal with these yeah. wonderful people. Now, in the early days, when you looked at Zuma, he was looked like quite a nice person. What is it that made him swing? It's a very sad story. I mean, when I knew him, he was in the military wing of the ANC. He also was involved. He was Tabo Mbeki's deputy. He played a positive role in the negotiations towards a new constitution. And after that, he also played a positive role in dampening down the violence in Natal. So it is a tragedy that somebody who started out in that way ended up where he has done now, where what he's associated with has been the looting of state coffers. Now, you know, he, first of all, with the Sheikh brothers, there were some extremely dodgy dealings which were all in, examined in the courts before. Uh, then, you know, with the, the Sheikh brothers were sort of more or less elbowed aside by the Gupta brothers, but their ambitions were more extensive. They, their ambitions were to really systematically siphon money out of the state coffers via, you know, their control of contracts for ESCOM and their control of contracts for Transnet at the time, and Donnell, and so on. I know how it happened. I mean, I had a conversation with Zuma when he said, you know, when you, you, you know because you were there. I was in Johannesburg when they all came back from exile. That we came back with nothing. We had nothing. We had no secretary, no car, no house, no salary, nothing. They all relied, to some degree, on businessmen helping them to get established, and so on. Now, in his case, the businessmen wanted a lot of favors in return, and he delivered those favors, or some of those favors, that's all going to be examined in the courts. We'll see where the courts come out on that. But, um, you know, the, the originally he was concerned about the education of his children. The Sheikh brothers promised to help look after the education of his children. P all sorts of people made loans to him, which never, of course, got repaid. But having made loans to him, they expected some rewards for the loans that had been made to him. And this is the way, you know, this, this sort of endemic corruption takes hold. Now the endemic corruption. I know you have a lot of hope for the country and the future of yes. the country, but this corruption has seeped right down even to the bottom uh, levels. How do we get rid of this culture of corruption? Well, it's very tough because, you know, Pravin Gordon actually helped me with this book. 
he, he, he looked, he read through the, the chapters on state capture, made some suggested alterations and so on, so I'm very confident that they are accurate. They, you know, Pravin, you know, having, having helped with them. But he's now back in charge, thank goodness, of putting an end to state capture in those terms. And he, he will do. I mean, already the ESCOM board has been totally changed. It's a now a very respectable, reputable board. Same with Donnell. He'll do the same in other cases. So he and Cyril, between them, can definitely stop corruption at the center. Now, how you stop corruption in the provinces, of the kind described by Christian Olver in his extraordinary book, How to Steal a City, uh, or uh, the sort of things that were happening in Pomolango, described by Suzui Yende, now that's much more difficult, and that is corruption at the, at the local level, at the regional level, and so on. Now, you know, there are examples of how to deal with it. I mean, Helen Zilla has run a province, the Western Cape, which everybody acknowledges, even her political opponents acknowledge, to be far better run than the other provinces. And she's very intolerant of corruption, so it can be fought. You have two mayors, who, both of whom I really admire, Herman Mashaba in Johannesburg, you have Soli Msimanga in, in Shwani, you know, really attacking corruption, and, and uh, corruption's been attacked also in Nelson Mandela Bay. So it can be done, but it has to be systematically done. Now, with the <coughs> elective conference, you also talk quite a bit in the book about the what led up to the politicking yes. around leading up to the elective conference and the surprise that was in there for people. Well, it was because, you know, Cyril won by 90 votes out of 9,000. It was by no means certain. It was anything but certain that Ramaphosa would win that. Now, let's imagine what would have happened if he hadn't won. You know, it would have been a continuance of the Zuma regime in one way or another and of the Gupta association with it in one way or another. The first thing that would have happened would have been that ESCOM would have been unable to pay its debts. People would no longer have been prepared to pay lend money to ESCOM given the nature of its leadership and what they had got up to in the past three or four years. So also the, the situation, it was no longer, the, the constitution had been subverted by Zuma appointing prosecutors who didn't prosecute or who only prosecuted the good guys, they prosecuted Pravin, not the wrongdoers. Investigators who didn't investigate, except that they also tried to investigate the good guys like Ivan Pillay, who's still in the courts, by the way. Um, so, that, so that he neutralized you know, the, the investigating authority, the prosecuting authority, and so on. But that wasn't going to be enough, because the press and the judiciary were still free and independent. And there would have been attacks on the independence of the press, and on the independence of the judiciary, and on changing the constitution, not just undermining it, but changing it fundamentally. So we just got by on the skin of that. Yes, I mean, I really do think that South Africa was close to the edge of a cliff. I mean, from the point of view of your foreign friends and investors, that's how it looked to us. Now, Cyril has a genuine commitment to the Constitution. So does half the ANC. The other half of the ANC, it wasn't so clear by any means at all. Uh, but now I think the Constitution is in pretty safe hands. I know there's going to be a change over land. I doubt if it will be a drastic one. And something does, by the way, need to be done about land distribution in this country in the right way. It's got to be done. <coughs> Lord Rennick, thank you so very much for, for talking to us. Thank you. You absolutely have to read this book. Uh, it is How to Steal a Country, State Capture and Hopes for the Future in South Africa. Until next time, goodbye.